So good morning to those of you who are in the Americas. Um, good afternoon and good evening to those who are joining us from Europe, Africa, and Asia. Um, welcome to our conversation today on histories of global health, COVID-19, and Asian responses. My name is Manjiri Mahajan. I'm Associate Professor for International Affairs and Co-Director of the India-China Institute at the New School University in New York. I'll be in conversation today with the historian of science, Professor Jean-Paul Godillet. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic continues to defy easy attempts at prediction and control around the world. In North America and the UK, mass vaccination rollouts are center stage and infection rates seem to have plateaued, even though at fairly high levels. In Europe, there is a lockdown in France. There are increased restrictions in many other countries like Germany. Um, India is seeing a big spike in states of Maharashtra and Kerala and several big cities, including Delhi. Um, so even as many parts of the world lurch through second, third, fourth waves, and through a disjointed public health response to the epidemic, what has been relatively consistent is that in number of countries in East Asia and also Southeast Asia continue to have a sustained success in curtailing morbidity and mortality due to the virus. In an earlier panel of the India-China Institute, we had brought together experts on China, South Korea, Vietnam, and Japan, countries which are, if you will, global health exemplars, to understand better how these countries were controlling the epidemic. Today's conversation has a related but a different motivation. What we want to do today is interrogate the field of global health and how the expertise and the interventions of this field have developed historically. So part of our interest here is to try and understand how this field has incorporated particular models, but also ignored and sidelined other models, which have been, for instance, adopted by many East Asian countries. We are very fortunate to have with us today for this conversation, Professor Jean-Paul Godillet, who's, uh, as I noted, a historian of science. He's a professor at the School of Advanced Studies in the Social Sciences at Paris. Um, he is also a senior researcher and the former research director at the Center for Research in Medicine, Science, Health, Mental Health and Society at INSERM, which is the National Institute for Medical Research. So it's for those of us in the United States, the French NIH. Um, Jean-Paul's earlier work focused on the reconfiguration of medical research, especially based on the history of drugs in the 20th century. Um, he also did research on the emergence of the field of environmental health and risk-based health governance, um, and is the author and editor of several volumes on these issues. But more recently, he led a multi-year collaborative global health project, which was funded by the European Research Council um, this was a historical and anthropological study on the transition from an international public health regime, which prevailed until, let's say, about the 1980s, to the current global health regime. Um, the project recently led to the publication of the edited volume, Global Health and the New World Order, which has been published by the Manchester University Press. So we could not have asked for a better interlocutor with whom to think through genealogies, trajectories, and limitations of global health regimes. Um, so Jean-Paul, welcome, and thank you very much for joining us. Uh, before I start asking a few questions of you, I want to note that the audience can um, write questions in the Q&A box, um, but the chat function will not be open to the audience. So, so let me, um, Jean-Paul, start by asking you um, a question about periodization in a way. Um, in your work, you make the distinction between a period of international health and a later period of global health. Um, so maybe we can start by you know, discussing about how you see this distinction between international health and global health, um, and what you see as the distinctive features of the field of global health, especially in its breaks and discontinuities with an older period of international health. 
Okay, so first, thank you for the opportunity to have this conversation. I'm sorry I missed the previous event, and well, maybe you can tell uh, tell me a little bit more about the uh, <clears throat> what your Asian experts had had to say about the, all these issues. Now, so uh, well, if you say international health, then there is. I mean, historians will when they are alone. Uh, we immediately think about the 19th century and the, the fact that uh, international health started to exist in, during, in the second half of the 19th century with the treaties which were signed in order to regulate or to, and, you know, to, uh, in order to try to control the spread of uh, epidemics, uh, especially cholera, and uh, to therefore have a hand on the, the flows of people, goods, and so, especially between Asia and, and Europe. But uh, this is not international health in the, in the way we, we try to thought about it, because this was international in the sense of negotiate, diplomatic negotiation between countries, not in the sense of having a field organizing interventions and a series of uh, supra national institution uh, investing and uh, taking care, well, thinking about health issues. So in that sense, international health is the a product of the 20th century. And if I'm a little more specific, it is a, a product of the, the long, well, the entire war up to the end of World War II period has powerfully exemplified by the uh, the creation, the establishment of the WHO as part of the UN system in the in the, in the late 1940s. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting in terms of periodization is that there is a kind of uh, 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 not a consensus, but a strong feeling of historians about the periodization of this post World War II development and. Uh, in the project you mentioned, we actually built on that. We, did, we didn't try to say there is, a, we are creating a, an alternative periodization or so, we, we built on that and it's more or less, it says that uh, we can, one may distinguish between three periods. One is, the, is associated with the 1950s and 1960s. So it's the immediate post-war, it's very much embedded in the, the dynamics of uh, the Cold War is the, the most strict sense of the Cold War with the two superpowers and the relation between the, uh, the USSR and the United States. And it was a period, uh, I mean, if one tries to think about the ways in which international health has existed, I think it's convenient to uh, have in mind three different layers. One is which actors are involved, the second one is about the, the, the tools that are mobilized or used, including the expertise, the forms of knowledge involved. And the third are the targets or what are the, the big aims and the goals of the world health. And if you think about that with uh, the 1950s, 1960s, it's a time when uh, health intervention were actually let, mostly organized uh, in a bilateral way through agreements between two or a few, a few states, targeting uh, infectious uh, diseases, transmissible dis disorders, pathologies, and uh, focusing on the, the vertical organization of programs. Vertical mm -hmm. in the sense that you target one disease with a specific pal small palette of technologies or, or tools. So the, the best exemplar, which has been very much investigated by historians was the fight against malaria and the way in which uh, for 15 years, investments were made in order to eradicate malaria in Asia and in Latin America on the basis of the use of DDT and the, the math spreading of DDT to kill the mosquitoes and stop the transmission to, uh, to humans. And as you, you know, and uh, many people know as well, it was not a big success 
Uh, and by the mid 1960s, uh, malaria had returned in most of the places where it has been first eradicated for a, for a few years. And finally, on the, uh, due to this failure, the uh, big malaria campaigns were interrupted. And this contributed to the rise of, uh, or to the second moment, the second period historians have been pointing to, which is the, what we may be called the third world period of international health, which is the, the 1970s, uh, early 1980s, when WHO adopted the a new strategy, the primary healthcare strategy, which was uh, very much building on the the rise and the, the mounting role taken by the newly independent countries within WHO. So it's in a sense, it's uh, very much the product of the, the decolonization wave of the, uh, the 1960s. And uh, uh, primary healthcare actually emphasized a much more social understanding of uh, uh, health intervention, focusing on the, anti for instance, a broad understanding of health integrated within development initiatives uh, putting forward the idea that uh, one needs to define basic priority needs, but the uh, basic needs have to be dis uh, decided upon not only by experts, but also by the communities and focusing on a slightly different model of tools, which was to insist on the fact that uh, simply transferring technologies from the north to the south was in most instances due to, uh, to failure. And that one has had to think about more about cheaper, more simple and more socially acceptable technology. technology. And so the, uh, the, the classical way to define the, 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 the changes between the first regime and the second regime was to say that the first one was about horizontal technology oriented program and the second one was more, was, sorry, the first one was more vertical and the second one was more horizontal. And then comes global health. And in the, the classic periodization of the historian, global health is actually the product of the uh, neoliberal turn of the 1980s, 1990s, which undermined the implementation of this primary healthcare strategy and uh, weakened the WHO in favor of new actors like the, the World Bank and uh, contributed to uh, a th somehow a kind of return to the vertical model of the 1950s, 1960s. In a return in the sense that instead of uh, uh, socially integrated or horizontal initiative, the emphasis was placed on efficient programs and therefore selected interventions for which had to be decided upon the, uh, the uh, feasibility, mm -hmm. the, the performance they would brought and the uh, cost benefit balance, which was part of the uh, broader economization of health, which was carried uh, over, carried out by the new, the new actors in global health. So yeah. that's the, in a sense, the classical scenario. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you know, I think I, I find a lot of what you've said very analytically useful, this emphasis on actors, tools and targets to specify a field of global health. Um, and I mean, if you just stuck with this, this idea of a making of a field of global health in the 90s and the last couple of decades, um, you know, this is a field which has specific orientation, some of which you have already mentioned. Um, it has particular models that it privileges, particular knowledge systems that it really privileges. And then it has also 
systematic silences. It has kind of vivid absences of models. Um, and, and, you know, COVID has made some of those absences especially stark. So a lot of um, social medicine, public health oriented models that have been adopted by public health systems in East Asia, for example, elided many of the global health paradigms and programs. So I'm, you know, could you talk, I, I'm wondering if you could, if we could discuss a bit about where this extant regime of global health draws its principal models and orientations from, what it doesn't take on, um, and as a second step, how this then ends up landing very differentially in different parts of the world. So what a World Bank um, Gates funded designed project looks like when it lands in Africa is in, in a country in sub-Saharan Africa is very different from what it looks like or um, when it lands in certain parts of Asia or it probably also in many instances doesn't ever land in Asia. So, so I, I'm interested in both kind of where global health draws its principal paradigm from, what it aligns, but then how also it gets instantiated on the ground. Okay, so thanks. Before we, we, we talk about re the regionality, then I think that they are really, really important to take into, into account. Let, let me say a couple of things about the what's visible and what's not visible. Mm -hmm. in global in global health and so because i mean um, even if it's absolutely true and relevant to insist upon the the uh, the relation between the economization of health and and global health and therefore to to have in the background the role neoliberalism has played in the advent of global health it's at the, it is at the same time i think wrong to reduce it to that and there are many, if you think about the whole palette, tools, targets, actors, many things in global health, which have little to do with, uh, with uh, the neoliberal paradigm and are important to take into account. One example, one good example is the, the, the kind of diseases which are visible and taken into account within global health. If you, if you look at the, the funding, Mm -hmm. Then there is a massive continuity. Global health is focusing on uh, uh, transmissible disorders, is focusing on epidemics, is focusing on infectious disorders. That's where 95% of the money goes. And yet, if you think about uh, epidemiological discourses associated with global health, if you think about the programs, if you think about the overall uh, discourses about the global burden of diseases, then there is a major shift. And it's because chronic disorders are forefront. And the global health has a, a discourse about the convergence of diseases between the North and the South, which didn't exist before, which was not there in the 50s, which was not there in the 70s and so, saying that, for instance, mental health is today one of the major issues all over the world, in, I mean, in Asia, in Africa, as well as in North America or, or Europe. And yet, there is a kind of internal invisibility because it's not part of most of the intervention. And it's, as, I, as I mentioned, there is this paradox that it's, as it's present, it's this talked about, and yet little is done about it. So that's what one kind of invisibility associated with global health. Another kind in general is what we, in the, in the project we ended up with, which is to insist upon the difference between global health as a field and health globalization. And th these are two, two different layers in the sense of two, two different ways in which health exists at, uh, beyond the national level. So global health is, as a field, this is for instance, the tuberculosis program, where you have uh, 
uh, international coalitions, you have money, you have a standard of intervention, which is the, the DOTS chemotherapy uh, therapy regimen, which is implemented all over the world through the programs and so forth. So really, there is a strong institution. Globalization of health, this is for these are the processes through which health entities are, are circulating, are globalized. And a very good example, which is completely invisible in global health, that's what happened, what happened to the, 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 the medical system, the traditional medical systems of Asia in the past 20 years. I mean, if you take Ayurveda, if you take China, Chinese medicine, medicine, they are very much circulating in between Asia and Africa, in between Asia and Europe and so forth. But that kind of circulation is not visible in global health. It's not considered part of global health and it's not acted upon. So that's the way the, uh, some things are visible in the field and not, and, and, and are invisible, although they can, they may have a massive impact in medicine. So then I come to your, your point about the regionalities and, the, and especially the, uh, the contrast between Africa and Asia, I would say. I mean, the, the historian Frederick Cooper once talked about the, what, how did he phrase it? I think it was the, the tyranny or, or the, the dictatorship, I don't remember the exact word, of the global. And what Cooper was thinking about what the, was the, the, ten, the tendency for self-proclaimed generality associated with analysis of the global. And he was insisting upon the fact that you have to, to work at different scale. So you have to, uh, to look at the local, you have to look at the global, but also you have to look at the regionality. You have to look at what the circulation and the, the, the processes which happen at levels of a few countries, uh, a continent or or a region like the Indian Ocean, for instance, with the circulation between East Africa and India, as an as example. And when you take that into account, the contrast between the different region and the relation to global health are amazing. And they must be taken into account, otherwise you, it's difficult to understand what's going on. And in terms of uh, thinking about Africa versus Asia, one may say that Africa is the playground of global health and has been very much impacted by the, the rise of global health, the new agenda, the, the new ways of handling uh, uh, transmissible disorders. Whereas uh, East and South Asia both were much less impacted and became, had become, in, the, in due time, had become much less dependent from global health program than, uh, than Africa. And uh, I'm not talk longer uh, about that, but just to want to insist on the fact that, uh, I mean, and this was rightly pointed to by James Ferguson in his, uh, in his book, Global, global Shadows. Africa as such has uh, had a, a very difficult time since the 1980s, 1990s, when global health started to exist. And there is a, a, a strong relation between the, the two. I mean, the fact that beyond health, uh, the weakness of many African states, I mean, what Jean-François ba Jean Bayard calls the, the, the status as border states, so states managing enclaves associated with extractive economies has been reinforced and uh, uh, by the conjunctions of two major, it's not events. I mean, we are talking about things which are events, but more, more profound and deep than that. I mean, structural adjustment policies and the AIDS crisis. And the, the conjunction of the two has been uh, a quasi disappearance in many places 
not all. I mean, South Africa is a, is a, is a different case. Uh, Burkina Faso, for instance, is a, diff is a different case. Uh, and so forth. But the disappearance in many places of a public well, and health infrastructure. And I'm not talking about public health here. I'm talking of a, a publicly organized, managed, and uh, uh, financed health infrastructure. And what you have uh, as the consequence of these, these processes is what, for instance, uh, the anthropologists of the AIDS have described in, in many ways. And so, which is the fact that most healthcare is provided either by NGOs or private actors. And uh, with a very, very uh, strong gradient in terms of access, in terms of quality of care, in terms of continuity of care. And that's where the, the global health program has become in a way uh, absolutely mandatory. Uh, and well, just take the, the case of Mali, we, uh, which I know a little bit more about because we had somebody working there in the, in the project. In Mali, 80% of the, the, what's invested in health is actually coming from international programs. So we, I mean, even, it's difficult to find an equivalent in many, in, in, in many Asian countries, I would say. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, this, th there's a lot what you've said that I want to pursue and raise questions about, about why there were these, why there are these selective silences. And, and I think one thing that maybe I'm hoping we can come back to is that um, we can explain how Africa and why many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa become a kind of experimental terrain for global health programs. Um, by looking at their situation, you know, by looking at histories of state, how they're embedded in a global financial system. But it's also curious as to how certain centers of expertise in Geneva, in Washington DC, in Seattle, um, don't take on models of social medicine, of public health medicine um, that Asian countries embrace much more fully. And, and, and you know, it's this, this why there is this preference for NGOization, for donor-driven vertical programs, as opposed to broad-based um, public health models and building a broad-based infrastructure that, that I'm kind of curious about. But, but I, I do want to kind of, maybe we'll come back to this, but I do want to kind of move on to COVID because in yeah. some ways, the field of global health sets the stage for how we have experienced um, COVID-19 around the world, right? Um, in some ways, the pandemic and the responses to it reinforce the imaginaries and the characteristics that you've been talking about that underwrite mm -hmm. this field of global health. Um, but then in other ways, COVID has also challenged some of the presumptions that underwrite the field of global health. But maybe, maybe we can start off by your um, you know, saying a bit about how you see global health, given its characteristics, in some ways became the perfect setting of stage for, for a pandemic like the one that we are in the midst of right now. Yeah, well, uh, just a, a quick observation before I move to, to COVID-19. If you look at the way uh, uh, intervention in, in global health are portrayed in Seattle at the uh, Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, which is in a sense one of the big, big calculation centers of, of global health where the global burden of disease is, uh, is, uh, is completed. Uh, and well, there is therefore a systematic uh, collection of data about uh, the financing of global health. And look at the, the way it is portrayed then you, China is nowhere. China, the, the, uh, the aid China is providing, for instance, to many African countries in terms of building hospitals and, and so on. I mean, it's not considered part of global health. And uh, I think that this absence, in, I mean, talks a lot about the, 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 the divide between the 
field and the the processes of globalization as well as, as, well as mentioning but is also very relevant to the question of global health and covid-19 yeah yeah and i mean i think what you're saying is so true even when one talk, when one examines what is being called vaccine diplomacy right um, yeah. when china or india um give vaccines to countries in africa it's seen as geopolitical strategy to shore up future um strategic resource needs that these countries might have whereas when dfid or usaid or the biden administration talks about giving vaccines which by the way mostly they haven't um it's seen as altruistic aid um so there is this kind of very clear divide about what gets counted as part of a regime of global of aid of altruism um and what is seen as or, or maybe just not seen for the most part and if it's seen it's seen in far more cynical terms but anyways you should go go ahead with anyway uh, and and one of the one of the problem with this invis invisibility is that it also makes difficult to think and to reflect upon the the limitation of these interventions or the way they relate to a new form of uh, uh, hierarchy between countries a new form of imperialism or also so it's both it, it goes in both direction but but anyway so uh, in terms of global health and covid-19 i mean the uh, the key word i would say is preparedness and one needs to think about what preparedness preparedness meant for europe or north america versus versus asia uh and uh in a way global health was really badly prepared in spite of the fact that uh global health as a field here is focusing on the control uh if not the eradication of transmissible disorders and therefore of epidemics and it was badly prepared i think for various reasons i mean one is the the importance granted to the north south divide i mean global health is about the health of others i mean that's the title of the the book we gonna so that's the, the the small advertisement bit here the that which is coming out soon at uh, radgers university press with the result of the pro, the main result of the project so it's about the health of others so it's about basically north northern based funded framed interventions in order to improve the health of southern of people living in the various south mm -hmm. so that one with the consequence of that is uh, that something like uh, covid i mean a major pandemic uh, <clears throat> having tremendous impact in Europe or North America was barely thinkable within global health. It's not that it was not thought about. I mean, it's, it was the question of uh, uh, such a, a new flu pandemic, for instance, was very much at the center of uh, uh, biosecurity and uh, preparedness initiative in Europe and the United States. But, based on a very specific regime which is not a global health intervention regime it's a it's a, it's a biosecurity regime so it has little to do with with public health so so that that's one reason the second reason uh, why global health was barely prepared has to do with the tools with the fact that global health and i didn't mention that among the the main features of the field but it is about biomedical tools it's it's global health has very much reinforced reinforced the, the pharmaceuticalization of health the recentering of interventions around drugs and the two main instruments it was trying to develop and to make accessible are vaccines and drugs and for one year we had nothing like that so we suddenly we everybody was back into quarantine into isolation into managing social relation and implementing this new wording of social dis uh, dis uh, distanciation <laughs> technologies so we uh, 
for an historian, I mean, this was absolutely fascinating because we were, we were reinventing techniques of epidemic control, which had dominated the history of medicine for, for two centuries, but with some new technologies. Okay, mm -hmm. I admit. But, and, and the third thing I want to mention is uh, that global health was badly prepared because it, to a large extent, built on a strong critique of the nation state and its ability to, to intervene. I mean that uh, the states have been seen in global health as mandatory partner, but has heavily problematic entity because of their bureaucracy, because of their inability to perform well, because of the uh, lack of proper management. So global health was very much also about reforming the state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And here, again, for one year, what it's all about state intervention and health systems considered at large, not specific se segments, not, not the hospitals, only health systems. And yeah. uh, so three weaknesses. Yeah, and, and, and I think this is where the Asian countries, especially the East Asian countries, come out so strongly because they don't follow any of these tenets of the rule book of the field of global health. You know, there's enormous emphasis on the state. Uh, there isn't a monopoly of thinking about health through the lens of technology. Um, there is an investment in infrastructure, which is broad based, equitable and accessible to the entire population. Uh, I, I'm looking at the time and I know there are questions from the audience that I want to take up, but maybe one last question, since you are sitting in Paris and since your country has instituted a new lockdown in the face of a significant spike, um, I, I just want to ask you how you, uh, you know, here is a wealthy country that has universal health coverage. It has a public health system that it's quite proud of, unlike let's say the United States where the public health system has been historically been underinvested in and it's in shambles. And yet a country like France has performed relatively poorly in managing the pandemic. Um, how should one understand this failure? And um, how should one understand this failure, especially if it's juxtaposed to that of comparable East Asian countries like that of Japan or South Korea? Yeah, yeah. Uh, tough question. Also because it's, uh, it's recurring. I mean, we are entering the, the third lockdown and uh, we may talk about that in the, in the discussion, but it's not looking much better than the first, the first two lockdowns I mean, in terms of managing the pandemic. And, uh, so, but uh, again, let me start with one major observation in mm -hmm. terms of uh, uh, these, these comparison and the way to, to handle it. I mean, if you look at, uh, as crude and simple uh, an indicator as mortality per 100,000 people. It's a, I mean, we are facing a very unexpected and fascinating situation. I mean that you have two groups of countries. I mean, on the one hand, with a mortality above 100, in the range of 130, 150, and so forth, you have all of Europe and North America. And in below 10, so one order of magnitude be lower, even, even more if you take uh, Taiwan or Singapore. So you have most of Asia. And with such a disparity of status, wealth, countries, I mean, you have Japan and South Korea, as you mentioned, but Cambodia and Thailand as well, or even India, which is below, still below 10 and so on. So, so this, is a, this is a major question for me. And how, how can we understand that? How can we understand this kind of regional convergence? And uh, even if it has certainly a lot to do with health system, with the role and so, uh, it's beyond that, because you also have a, 
a high diversity of uh, uh, investment in the health system of organization pattern uh, be in between all these all these countries. So, so what I'm going to say about France is part of the response. It's mm -hmm. not the the whole of the response. And for instance, we we I mean it would be absolutely wonderful now to have a, a specific comparative investigation about public uh, public health in Europe versus Asia in the past 20 years but in order to to better understand that and uh, taking into a so what I mean is that for instance the dynamics of COVID-19 has something to do with the the specific epidemiology of the of the disease so for instance that age is playing a critical role and therefore not uh, leading into the same patterns in Japan, India, or, or France. I mean, have, uh, here family structures have a role, the way age, uh, aging people are taken care of as a role and, uh, and so forth. But if we come to France and to the, the difficulty at handling the pandemics, which has been illustrated by, for instance, something we started to investigate and in, it's very interesting to think about in comparative ways, which is the, the official WHO strategy. Testing, tracing, isolating. France has been unable to implement, implement that for one year now. Basically, if you look at the, the background for this, it is the massive weakness of public health. Mm -hmm. And uh, here you have very, I mean, France has a, has a very good hospital system, has invested very massively in biomedicine, but has had a poor inf public health infrastructure for decades now. So one consequence, for instance, well, was that you don't have people to do epidemiological, local epidemiological surveys. You don't have people to trace contacts. I mean, so this, this was simply not there. And you can have, well, one needs to think about that also in terms of different temporalities. So that this weak, this systematic structural weakness of public health has different roots. One is, is a long one. It's uh, the, the biomedicalization of the system and the rise of chronic disorder. So that everything having to do with epidemics and so forth was, was no longer a priority, was no longer needed, yeah. was not considered needed. And you have over developments which happened much more recently. So for instance, the, I just take uh, the example of SARS because it's one of these issues which strongly shows it the, or illustrate the difference with Asia. In 2003 in France, uh, well, SARS was, was considered and there was a reorganization of the uh, uh, preparedness plans. It was decided that uh, masks were important. Uh, following the exam uh, exemplars of, of Asia. 2009, the stock of masks was given up and it was the, the direct consequence of budgetary cuts and of the, uh, the financial crisis and its consequences. So you see how the, the different temporalities uh, have been at stake. But more uh, what, what one can say is that our country has taken very, very different lessons from SARS, from those uh, understood and or from the way the SARS experience was understood and uh, listened to in the, in the context of Asia. And basically the lesson in France was that, oh, what you need to do is actually to prepare plans in order to control an imported epidemics. So that you just need a small infrastructure for that because it's a matter of handling a few dozen cases of travelers that might bring the disease in the country. 
And yeah. then you, you end up just controlling the border and controlling the border is not enough. So it, it really brings it to the global health security surveillance way of thinking about pandemics rather than building public health infrastructure. And I think a lot of what you just said, you know, is points us to a debate that is going on in many different places about how COVID-19 really unsettles and problematizes these categories of North and South that we take for granted in global health. Um, it blurs the boundary, but also really questions whether these categories, um, whether in terms of expertise or programs or outcomes really have the kind of traction that they should. Uh, but, but we could go on, but I do want to move to some questions from the audience. Um, we have several questions from Yanis uh, and I'm afraid I'm going to massacre his last name, Zili Gakis, but I might maybe just pick one question um, of the several he's given. Um, it says, how can we break the vicious cycle in which the medical sector creates viruses, diseases, crisis to milk more money and resources from local and global society? Then they ask us to pay them in order to cure the diseases they create. That's one question. Which is, that's one question. <laughs> I don't know. No, it's a very, it's a very big question. I'm not sure if uh, COVID-19 has been created in that sense. Uh, it's. Uh, I just want I just want to mention one thing, which uh, I don't know whether it was in the U.S. Uh, or in Asia, but one of the uh, striking feature of the public debate in the during the first lockdown and the, the last print uh, was the way uh, COVID-19 was linked to the ecological and environmental crisis. Uh, and uh, in the French context, there were two, two different discussions. One was uh, about the lockdown itself and the fact that entire sectors of the economy had been stopped and that as a consequence, the environmental ecological situation improved. So for instance, well, the pollution within, within the French cities was much lower and, they, and the, the health of the people was, was improving. And one discussion was therefore, how, uh, how can we think about this experience and uh, think about the ecological transition, the parameters and, uh, and so. But the second discussion which is more, is I think uh, interesting in, in connection with the, the question you, you asked me. This is the one about the origins of SARS-CoV-2 and the, the uh, COVID-19 and the ways in which it is or it is not related to uh, patterns of production, consumption, uh, and uh, with the status of uh, ecosystems and the, the relationship between animals and humans. And uh, I mean, there is a still very serious discussion. I mean, it has been exemplified, for instance, by the, the report of the International Panel on Biodiversity that uh, was issued in, the, in last July, uh, which look at the, the changing pattern in emerging diseases and the, the acceleration of uh, new zoonoses and new examples of uh, emerging uh, uh, viruses and emerging pathogenic bacteria linked to changes in the, in the, eco, uh, the ecosystems and the, the biodiversity situation. And, COVID is a very good candidate for that. Yeah. We, so it means that one of the ways in which we, I think we need to consider seriously the creation of diseases for which then we have to act upon and so forth has to do with that, has to do with, uh, with uh, uh, the mounting importance of environmental health and interestingly enough, and I will end up with, end with this, uh, planetary health and one health have become kind of parallel or 
connected development to global health. So mm -hmm. there, is, there is now a layer of activities, discourses, and so which somehow repeat the birth of global health 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I would just hope and like it doesn't end up in the kind of in the one. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, and I think of the uh, regimen that yeah. global health is. I mean, if there's one thing we can hope from from the whole experience of COVID is precisely this, a kind of reframing of health, global health, public health at every different level as being completely entangled with questions of the environment and the planet. Um, but let me go on to other questions. So um, we have a question from Nicole Barnes. Um, she asks, on the shift from 1970s third world paradigm to the neoliberal World Bank dominated return to the vertical model, was this a cunning takeover to grasp political power out of the hands of African and Asian nations? What dynamics informed this shift? I mean, that's several books right there, but... Um, okay, two, one. A yes and no response. Very schematic, <laughs> very schematic one. The yes response is, has to do with the fact that the third world moment of international health, WHO and so forth, was very much connected to the claims that third world countries made for a new international economic order. And very much connected to the, the response to these claims, the uh, United States in the first place, Europe on the uh, second rank made and the the emergence of the Washington consensus, to, to put it very, very bluntly. And in the field of health and the uh, role of WHO and so forth, there is a very uh, interesting and powerful illustration of that, which is the, the policy for uh, uh, essential drugs WHO had invented in the context of the primary healthcare strategy. And I, no. We could, we could delve into the details of the story. It's a, it's a very important one because it has to do with generics. Uh, it has to do with local production of pharmaceuticals. Uh, put it in two sentences, it was killed by the alliance of the United States and the, the uh, major pharmaceutical companies of the North, which feared that essential would mean, would mean that innovative patented drugs would be non-essential. Non so that's a case in the, the first direction. But I, uh, I'm cautious about reducing the entire dynamics of global health, its rise and so forth to this neoliberal agenda and to the, the, the political economy of the affair. Because there are many things which are typical of global health and do not uh, fit that framework of, uh, of interpretation. And one uh, example is the question of privatization. Privatization is often uh, presented as something typical of the new regime. Mm -hmm. And this is wrong. This is wrong in me. Uh, if you look at, for instance, the, the documents, most of the documents the World Bank produced and the way it acted in uh, handling its loans to uh, uh, southern countries, it's not about privatization. It's about reforming the state. It's about performance. It's about uh, management and the, the, the performance culture based on indicators, audit, and so forth. So it's, it's neoliberal, of course, but it's, it's not about uh, giving up the, the notion that the state has to uh, intervene, has to support health system. And so it's, it's about rationalizing, optimizing, and so forth. So it's ju just show how the, uh, and otherwise you would bar barely understand why uh, an institution focusing on economic development like the World Bank suddenly shifted in the, 90, in the 1980s, 1990s into massive investment 
in health. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So um, I see we, we only have five minutes, but I want to get to maybe a couple of questions, additional ones if possible. So one is from Angelica Messner, who says the so-called traditional medicine in East Asia, was it part of the tools used there? I don't know if this is a question you want to take on. Um, we have several others, if you would maybe prefer. Uh, used there where? In East, East Asia, I guess, is the, is the question. Are, was traditional medicine used as part of the tools to deal with COVID? Um, uh, it, my head notes don't have much to say about it. First, I, I know it was attempted. I don't know how to assess or whether there was, uh, uh, there were uh, experiments in order to to think about the the outcomes of that, but but it has been yeah. part of the tool. Yeah. So then, um, a, a question from my colleague Sakiko Fukudapar: um, Border control is not part of the international framework for global health security because the objective of the international health regulations is to keep borders open for trade and travel. Is this neoliberal agenda getting in the way of border control as a policy tool for pandemic governance? Uh, what is, uh, well, I would say that what is part of the agenda is border surveillance, not mm -hmm. border closure. But I mean, if I consider the, uh, the, the pandemic plans France adopted in the, in the 2000s, it was, it was about surveilling the border. Mm -hmm. It was not about closing it, and uh, I mean, it's exactly what happened in the in the past year. I mean, we okay, there were some frictions and tensions between European countries. So at some point, we you you had uh, uh, low well was a temporary closure of borders, but I mean, basically for one year, we never had anything like what Taiwan did in terms of, of actually closing some major patterns of, of circulation. I mean, Europe has, re has remained open and uh, it was just about uh, the kind of surveillance that has to become systematic or not. So for instance, whether you need a test less than 48 hours in order to cross the border. Yeah, so it is striking how many East Asian countries actually had relatively strict border controls yeah. compared to definitely the United States, which has been open, but but even compared to countries in Europe. Um, so maybe one last question. Um, Amitabha Sarkar asks about apparent failure of COVAX, um, but the question is, do you think this pandemic driven cooperation is just an instrumental change or is it going to be a constitutive change in the practice of global health governance? <laughs> I don't. Well, I hope it will be a constitutive change. At the same time, if you, if we look at the Covax story, it's not very much pointing to uh, in this direction because what happened with the Covax is a mere repetition of yeah. the classical uh, weaknesses with. Uh, uh, well, associated with global health when it comes to uh, public good and the, the, the putative existence of global public uh, good. Because well, what we had with the, we, we have for the time being with the COVAX is first, uh, local production is out. I mean, it was never seriously dis discussed whether uh, the, the WHO mechanism would help establish local production, which requires the transfer of intellectual property rights. So, I mean, the, that's, that part of the mechanism has remained pretty weak, precisely because none of the inventors of the vaccines, none of the countries associated with them, uh, participate in that segment. Even China is not doing it. Mm -hmm. They never, they never, I mean, they have negotiated bilateral agreements, true. They have negotiated, for instance, the create, the establishment of uh, producing factories in some countries, in Morocco and so, but this is part of uh, bilateral diplomacy and it 
has nothing to do with sharing the knowledge, sharing the patents and the know-how about uh, in he helping uh, local production at, at large. So that's one major weakness. And the second one is the, the current war on supply we have been facing. So that the second part of COVAX, the one which is very much in line with global, well, with uh, global health and its policy for access to drugs and so which is to do something like the global fund. So you create a funding mechanism in order to pay for the free access to uh, some drugs, those, those targeted. Even the, that part, which is very much in line with the, philo the philosophy of of global health is not working very, very well. I mean, yeah. it will probably very much improve in one year or, or 18 months when the pressure on the, on the supply will, will smooth, but... Yeah, no, I think so, COVAX actually represents a kind of depressing aspect of collaboration, right? Where it represents increased financialization, no move at all on IP, no broader, thinking of vaccines or other pharmaceutical goods as global public goods, even in the face of an emergency, if not more broadly, and a complete opacity regarding how these contracts have been negotiated, who's at the table, who's not at the table. So hopefully COVAX doesn't become the model for a reconstituted global health governance, if one is lucky. Yet, um, yet one sentence, Mondai, is the alternative is not I think to come back to bilateral aid organizations. So for instance, the alternative is not what the Chinese policy is nowadays. Nor MSF. So, I mean, there is, there is a need for rethinking how to think about global public goods in the context of global health, right? And we don't have a good model, or at least the good models which have been suggested haven't gotten any traction in the field. Uh, we are out of time. So I do want to wrap up. Um, so let me thank first and foremost, Jean-Paul for joining us today, sharing his insights. I feel this is a conversation that could go on and I hope we will continue it, but in some other uh, forum and format maybe. Uh, but I also want to take this opportunity to thank Professor Mark Fraser, who's my co-director at the India-China Institute, um, and India-China Institute's deputy director, Ms. Grace Howe and her team, um, and Michael at the New School IT Department, who ensure that things work seamlessly behind the scenes. Um, I should note that this event was co-sponsored by the Graduate Program in International Affairs at the New School, and we thank them for their support. Um, and finally, thank you all for in the audience who have joined us. Um, I hope you will join us again for our last event of the academic year, which is on April 29th at 9 a.m. New York time. Um, it will be a panel on India, China, and Africa, emerging transnational politics in the global south. Um, but thank you very much, Jean-Paul. And thank you so much. And um, we'll keep this going in some way. Yeah. I will, I will attend your next event. <laughs>